This is a joint work with Chris Blattman and Ben Lessing, who are uh, at the University of Chicago, and with uh, Gustavo Duncan, who's a colleague here at Universidad de Afit in Medellin, where I'm based. I'm a professor of economics here at, at, at the AFIT. So now I'm going to tell you about this work that we've been uh, doing for about five years uh, to try to understand gangs, their involvement in violence, and also how uh, and by what means can states uh, actually kind of uh, challenge the, the, the type of control that they exert over communities and the type of regulation that they, that they uh, uh, impose on, on many aspects of the criminal environment. Uh, so in Medellin, uh, most of you know it uh, because of uh, the Escobar cartel in the in the 90s. Medellin currently is a city where, uh, uh, like a relatively rich city in terms of, of, of how uh, developed is Colombia, uh, where virtually every low and middle income neighborhood has a local gang uh, called a combo. Uh, we, we're doing a census of gangs. We've been uh, uh, collecting information on roughly 350 of them, uh, and they control pretty much every centimeter of the city in the territories that where, where they are present. Uh, they have existed for decades and have very well-defined borders. Uh, these gangs beyond being present in, 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 in all these territories also regulate many uh, uh, like governance services. They provide, uh, uh, for instance, dispute resolution services for residents. They provide protection services. They, they charge extortion uh, uh, fees. Uh, in principle, in exchange of providing security. Uh, these groups also regulate most of the violence in the city. They use violence and regulate it. So they, for instance, forbid uh, homicides in some places, uh, but also, uh, uh, um, uh, of course, commit homicides. And about three quarters of all homicides in the city are linked to these gangs. Uh, in Medellin, we have roughly between 450 to uh, 600 homicides per year, and roughly three quarters of them are related to to gangs. And in war times, this is this is like currently where we are now in a sort of equilibrium, but in war times, this can uh, go uh, quite high. And for instance, in, in the last war between gangs in the city in 2009, homicide rates went from 30 to 95 per 100,000 residents in, in just two years. Uh, so they explain a lot of the violence in the city. And, and we in, in this study, we're trying to understand the type of control that they exert, how can this, the state uh, actually counter? So how does uh, like gang rule uh, respond to state projection of power? I'm telling you that gangs regulate many aspects of, of city life in many uh, parts of the city. Uh, and what can the state do about it? So we know that gangs govern uh, in principle to, that they provide services in exchange for a fee. Uh, and our impression is that, or our first impression was that gangs were actually just competing with the state in selling protection and other services. So they were providing security, providing dispute resolution services in exchange for a fee, competing with the state. And if you think like that as a normal duopoly, if one actor, for instance, the state starts to provide better services, then the gang would provide fewer services in, their, in the territory they control. Uh, but for the gang, governing has some intrinsic benefits and strategic benefits, uh, especially some externalities uh, to the drug trade because they protect some, some uh, parts of the city that they control, and then they're going to be able to enjoy the uh, 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 benefits of the drug trade easily because the state is not going to be uh, as present uh, in that territory as it would be in, 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 in a context where there are many thefts or many violence in, in, in the neighborhood. So which state, which effect dominates is a sort of empirical question. And, and we're trying to answer this with both a, a quasi experiment and an experiment in, in Medellin. So first, uh, uh, two slides on the quasi experiment. In 1987, the state introduced uh, new borders to provide some specific services related to dispute resolution and security. And these borders created these continuities, uh, as you see here, uh, the, the, there's, there's this border, and you will have two neighbors, one on either side of the, of the border. And some of the, one of these neighbors is going to be closer to the state than the other. So the, the creation of these borders introduces a discontinuity in access to state services. Uh, we're going to have residents who are otherwise the same, except for uh, uh, one of them is closer to the state than the other. And 30 years after that, we ran a survey uh, and we collected information on both sides of the, survey, of, the, of the border to understand whether the state is actually providing more services and whether the gang is providing fewer services or not. And what we find is that 30 years after the introduction of these borders, being closer to the state implies that you receive more services from the state, 
but it also implies that you receive more services from the GAN. Uh, and in particular, this effect concentrates in high value territories, which are places with high value drug markets. So gangs, what we see here is that gangs respond strategically to the state, the state provides better services, but then the gang provides more services, especially in those territories that they want to control more because they enjoy more uh, drug benefits in places where they enjoy more uh, residents loyalty and, and, and there's like more security and so on and so forth. But then we also run an experiment. We found out a few years uh, ago, uh, an intervention uh, of a program that was implemented by the city of Medellin, uh, focuses, focusing on service provision only. So they deployed uh, city liaisons to one territory where the gangs were quite strong. Uh, and the, the rest the, the, the city liaisons that were deployed by the city were not uh, police agents. They were just like brokers would help communities access uh, better state services. Uh, they were implementing these in one part of the city called La Loma that has a long history of violence and like uh, a strength uh, of the gangs that are present there. Uh, and then we worked with the city to scale this up uh, and set up a, 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 an experiment in the city. We identified 80 gang territories or sectors uh, with strong gang presence. Um, and we randomized half of them uh, to receive a treatment which was uh, like an escalation of this intervention that I was showing you before. Uh, this consisted mainly in two things. One, each of these uh, treatment sectors would have a full-time city liaison who would serve as a broker, as I was telling you before. They had like quotas for identifying problems in the city, in, in the community, making referrals, organizing semi-annual meetings between residents and authorities to try to solve problems. Uh, also help people access the police whenever the, the, the people wanted to access them. And, and we're just present 24, uh, uh, seven days a week and, and 24 hours a day, or I would say uh, 10 to 12 hours a day, uh, every day for one year and a half. And the second part of the intervention, these treatment sectors received like an increased attention of city services. So this is one uh, uh, event called Caravana de Convivencia, where the city deployed all their, uh, uh, all their uh, 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 services to these territories and try to just make it easier for residents to access these services. And what we found, uh, then we also ran a survey here to ask residents whether they were access accessing more or fewer services from the state and from the gang. And what we found was that the state was providing fewer services in treatment sectors or the residents were demanding fewer services from the state and they were demanding more services from the gang. Uh, this result is not precise, uh, but again, this is consistent with a strategic response by the gang to try to respond to more state presence by providing better and, and more services to the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the residents of these territories. So broadly, our work uh, suggests like a few insights. One is, uh, I guess, the, 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 the one conclusion that you, you wouldn't find uh, surprising is that gangs are complex and their motives to govern, to use and regulate violence are not fully understood. And they explain a lot of the violence in Medellin, but also in many cities. In the US, for instance, in cities such as Chicago or New York or, 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 or Los Angeles, part of the violence is explained by gangs. And we don't understand gangs. We don't understand, well, gang behavior. How do they use violence? How do they regulate violence? And so on and so forth. The second thing is that we thought like the market for protection, charging for extortion fees were, was the main reason why gangs were ruling and providing services. But what we find now is that it doesn't seem to be the main uh, 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 reason. Uh, gangs provide service and governance to protect other illicit rights, and mainly, for instance, the drug trade in the context of, of Medellin, the local drug trade. So as a consequence of this, it seems difficult for governments to crowd gangs out of their governing role, because common policy interventions, such as like nonviolent interventions, as the one I showed you, or for instance, police crackdowns, may not reduce gang rule, but rather induce in, like introduce new incentives for gangs to provide other kinds of services and respond strategically to state presence. Uh, then we think like besides, perhaps besides prosecuting criminal leaders and like governing better, what might uh, states need to do is to tackle ga gang revenues more directly to try to reduce the, like the structural part of these incentives. But there's one warning here is that anything that reduces uh, drug and illicit profits or, or this sort of illicit trends could lead to more extractive and violent gangs. Because in principle, the, the fact that, they, that these gangs want to protect their illicit brands 
is an incentive for them to also be nonviolent with residents. They want to earn like a, a citizen loyalty and they want to have the neighborhood uh, quiet with no violence, no theft, so that they can enjoy the illicit uh, market. If you try to change that incent those incentives, gangs might be more might turn to be more extractive and violent, such as uh, gangs in Central America in, in cities such as San Salvador and or, or Tegucigalpa. Uh, and one last point is that I guess broadly we need more descriptive, theoretical, and empirical work on gangs because organized crime and, and, and street gangs is arguably uh, the largest threat to national security and development in in the century ahead. Uh, and it's unclear whether the problem is going to be uh, 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 not worse in the in the coming decades, because many of, of these organized criminal groups uh, that uh, 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 are created in Latin America emerge during and after wars, and we have a lot of conflict that's stopping and stuff like that. Also, we have that it, the, the fact that there are illegal drug markets in every city means that there's an incentive for gang development, creation, and uh, uh, strengthening in every city because you need someone to provide the good and regulate the market. So it's unclear whether gangs are not going to be developing more and more in every city in the context of uh, uh, illicit, illicit drug markets. And also, and this is particularly important for the US, we have massive migration to the US, for instance, from uh, uh, countries in Central America. Uh, and, and we know already that these uh, 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 migration patterns are linked to the creation of, of, of gangs. Uh, so finally, like we view our qualitative interviews and the descriptive analysis, the experiment, the quasi experiment as proof of concept exercises of, of the kind of work that we believe is, is, is more needed to understand better gangs, to understand better the involvement of gangs in violence, and to understand better work, what can the state do about that.